Um, I'm Zoe, I'm the Digital Communication Specialist at CICM and I'll be hosting this webinar for the next hour. So before I introduce our fantastic panellists, there's just a few housekeeping points that um, I'd just like to make. Um, so the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be circulated after the event. Um, it will also be on demand on CICM's YouTube channel as well. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please post them in the chat box and we will try to answer them. Um, if there are any questions that we don't have a chance to answer, um, we will get these answered after the webinar and we'll have them emailed to you. And finally, we'd love for you to keep your videos on so we can see all your lovely faces. Um, but please try to keep yourself on mute so we can kind of stop any background noise. So without further ado, I'd like to begin the webinar. So firstly, I'm going to ask the panellists to just kind of briefly introduce themselves for those of you who, who don't know who they are. Um, so Jules, would you like to start for us? Well, I'll be the starter, yes. I'm <laughs> Jules Eames. Um, short uh, answer, I head up content and resource here at CICM, um, but I also teach, train, coach and mentor uh, our CICM uh, training and qualifications. Perfect. Uh, Catherine, would you like to go next? Hey, yeah, my name's Catherine Bailey. I'm the Group Credit Risk um, and Compliance Manager for a hotel management company. We've got 34 hotels within the UK, um, but I also teach for uh, the CICM and have done, I think it's coming up to about 10 years now. So I generally teach credit management um, and business environments. I also coach some of the LSS students um, and mentor anybody that needs some help. Amazing. And Hava, what about you? Yeah, uh, so I'm the assistant credit manager for the Southwest region for Edmondsons. Uh, just over four years experience in credit management, um, during which time I've done my level three and level five CICM. Uh, also work part time for the awarding side um, side of CICM and potentially starting to teach, uh, teach for them soon as well. Oh, amazing. And last but not least, Mary. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Mary Delahunty. I am the Qualifications and Apprenticeship Delivery Manager. So I work with lots of individual learners, helping them get themselves onto the right programme, but also employers who are doing that for groups of, um, of their teams. And I work quite closely with our training providers, their external training providers who um, manage the apprentices. And like Jules, I'm also a teacher. So I usually have one day a week teaching and a trainer as well. Lovely. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so before we kind of delve into the qualification side, um, I just want to know how each of you got into the credit industry um, because you answered last. Mary, would you like to go first? Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess like many, um, you often ask that question and lots of people say you, you fell into it um, mm -hmm. rather than it being a, a chosen career, although we're obviously doing lots to change that in CICM. Um, so I started off as a sales ledger clerk um, and uh, soon had the chance to help the credit control team. And I really love that. It's a, quite a marmite -ish, um, career, I think. So you say to some of your friends and family what you do, and they'd rather stick pins in their eyes than try to get <laughs> money out of people. But I really loved it and found that, that I was quite good at it. So um, after being sort of promoted to full time, time credit controller um, I soon got the chance to study and I was very fortunate maybe right place right time but I was a credit manager at 24 years old. Brilliant thank you for that how about you Jules? Uh, similar to Mary really I mean I've been fortunate enough to work in the consumer trade and export um, areas of credit um, but I started my credit career a little bit by accident too back in the 90s I was a credit control and collections clerk for um, Lloyd's Finance, so Lloyd's Bank's finance group. Um, honestly, hadn't heard about credit as a profession, hadn't heard of what was ICM back then. Um, but the thing that attracted me was the business. So the company name was what drew me in. Um, but similarly to Mary, uh, when I got into the role, I realized that I really liked it. And I think it is sort of job you either love or hate. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just I just flew from there, really. Perfect. Uh, Catherine, what would you like to say? Um, so I've been working in hotels since 1995. Um, we have to excuse the noise trickling past now because um, I'm in one of our hotel lobbies at the moment um, and literally started as a receptionist, um, went through, we had the millennium bug for those that remember that, you know, everything needed to be manual. <laughs> 
when when we went from 1999 to 2000 um and the financial controller at that time said we need a bossy bolshy female in accounts to do credit control can you help would you like to do it um i fell out of love with our guests front of house and thought going back of house would be a really good idea and the rest is history so i've been doing sort of this from um from, from 2000 brilliant and last but not least heva what about you uh, yes yeah, so i was in an operations management role before this um really enjoyed it but felt it was very one-dimensional it was just the, the management side of it and wanted something more technical um so i was uh, fortunate enough to see an opportunity with edinson's and the role seemed very one uh, multi-dimensional so there is a technical side of risk management account appraisals um and then you have the ma management side and then there's the customer facing side as well and it seemed like there's a lot of variation and that was very important for me for a role to be engaged in long term yeah so i uh, went, went with it brilliant i suppose like what mary said we see the answer that everyone fell into this industry or their role um which is kind of why CICM are working so hard to show that this is a profession that you don't have to fall into and it is a viable option for your career um so now if we move on to Catherine what made you undertake the CICM qualifications a bit of a strange one um I wanted to actually um I wanted to become a member of the Institute of Hospitality um and Basically, this said to me that I wasn't qualified enough. Um, having um, O levels, A levels wasn't wasn't considered sufficient. So I needed to undertake um, some additional qualifications. So being into finance um, at that time and very new into the job, um, I started doing um, an ACCA qualification for for non accounting managers um, and realised very quickly actually. Um, accounting wasn't for me in any shape or form. Um, I, I did the qualifications, I, I went through it, and it was during um, during that course that somebody actually mentioned to me, have you heard of the ICM? Um, and they told me what it was about. Um, and I looked at it and I thought, okay, um, let's give this a go. Um, and by starting those qualifications, I suddenly realised this is something that I really enjoyed. And I always say to any students um, or any people, any young people, um, if you're not sure what you do, what you want to do, don't commit to necessarily going to university or, or anything yeah. straight away. Find a subject yeah. you really enjoy and then get qualified in it because it makes the qualifications so much more interesting. And I went through all the qualifications as they went as, as, as a level three. Um, and then I went right up and I ended up doing my degree as well. And I did that all, all whilst I was working for the same company I'm working for now. They supported me all the way through um, to get me 100% qualified. That's brilliant. I love that answer. And how about you, Jules? Um, well, like many people, I was encouraged by my line manager to start my qualifications. As I said before, hadn't heard of the professionalism of credit as a career, I hadn't heard of the Institute at the time, um, but honestly, my step into qualifications was what opened me up to the whole network of support uh, within CICM, and that's what I've used ever since. Uh, I was lucky enough to um, get support with my employer throughout my level three to get ACICM, and then I, I went alone, I did it alone throughout my uh, level five and my, uh, my, um, uh, my university diploma, but uh, yeah, haven't looked back since. Brilliant. And I suppose like from my side, I'm a member of the Chartered Institute of Marketing. So it kind of makes complete sense that I feel that if you have a chance to become part of your professional body, that you should absolutely jump at the chance and kind of begin that ball rolling in terms of your professional development and kind of undertaking your qualifications. I mean, it looks great on your CV and you get the added bonus of having letters after your name. And I mean, who doesn't love, <laughs> who doesn't love a letter after their name? <laughs> I think as well with the with the with the being new to the institute as it was back then, you feel like you're just on the edge as a member. But then when mm -hmm. you get stuck into the qualification programs, it's suddenly like you're, you're thrust into the hub of it, and you've got all yeah. these wonderful, for want of a better word, family members. Yeah, they all surround you and look after you, and we all see ourselves through the courses. And it's yeah, it's a wonderful feeling. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose like it's it's all that 
with CICM and our members is all the help and support that each other give each other to that kind of you start that journey and then you're with everyone else and you finish mm. roughly kind of probably the same time as well and yeah. you get that sense of achievement that I have done this with the help of everyone oh we've lost Catherine where's what? Catherine gone <laughs> Okay, so uh, now I'd like to come over to Hiva. So um, you, I'm going to ask you from kind of a, a studying point of view, what made you start your qualification journey and how long did it take you to become CICM qualified? Uh, yep, yeah, so I, I was always um, very interested in advancement and I thought to do that I have to compete with people with a lot more experience than me. Um, so to compensate for that, I had to cram in as, as much development essentially as I could in the shortest amount of time. Yeah. Um, and the second point was, I think I, I wanted a stru structured program to make sure I do cover everything I need to know. Um, if you leave it simply to experience, it's very hit and miss, depending on your team, what tasks you get given, what responsibilities you get left with. Um, so that that was a, a sure way that I'll, by the end of it, I'll, I'll know everything I need to know. Yeah. Um, I think the entire process probably took about two and a half years, 18 months of which was for level three and the rest was level five, but I did have a few module exemptions, so possibly a little bit longer. Okay, and did you have any challenges or limitations that you faced during studying? Uh, I, I think you need to have the desire, first of all, before you start. There's yeah. always the support available, but you're not going to have someone checking on you weekly to make sure you're doing what you need to do. That, that does depend on you. Um, and I think discipline as well. With the level three, you get given time at work um so that does give you an opportunity to do, to do most of your work but you still need to put in time um, in your own time so you do need to be prepared for that and level five takes that to the next level where it's it's all in your own time so you do need to have that desire to do it and, and the discipline to stick to your um your, your plans yeah no that's a great answer and I'm sure it kind of resonates with a lot of our study members on this call too um and and just a quick quick one kind of CICM is here if you need any support or help um, and we have just launched a new CICM student connect uh, group on LinkedIn so it's a group for all our kind of study and members and those who have completed their qualifications um, for you all to help and support one another with any questions or concerns you might have. Um, so my colleague Tom is just going to pop the LinkedIn um, URL into the chat box. So if you'd like to join, just um, click on the link and, and we'll let you in. Um, so you've all completed CICM qualifications, um, but Mary, Jules and Catherine, you're also CICM teachers. Um, so if I can start with Mary, can you just tell us what made you want to teach CICM courses? Um, do you know what? That was another pleasant accident. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, so I did my CICM qualifications. I'd already signed up to do the qualifications before I was promoted. In, into a management position so then it became even you know more more um uh, important that I do them particularly level five because that really that really gave me the sort of knowledge and understanding um to feel like I could properly hold my own in in a boardroom um and really empowered in terms of knowing what I was talking about so I was really passionate about being able to give some of that back so I, I was already a member and um an active member with the branch but it was actually my old tutor who was thinking about stepping down from lecturing, who had a conversation with me and said, have you ever thought about teaching? I was like, no. And he sort of said, come along and have a chat in, into the college with the vice principal. And I thought, I was a bit flattered. I thought, what have I got to lose? And that was on a Tuesday. And I can remember somehow an hour later having agreed to turn up and teach on a Thursday. <laughs> and I can still see me walking down that corridor thinking what just happened and why. But it absolutely was one of those things in my life, I think, that was meant to be um, because I, I love it. I, you know, I, I, I love working for CICM, but I particularly love teaching because the, there's nothing quite like seeing people progress and feeling like you've played a small part in that. Um, so went on to do my teaching qualifications um, and it's great now that I still teach but I'm also helping people like Heather hopefully get into teaching so being able to work with with fellow professionals and see them develop that side of the career is great as well. Now that's such a lovely answer and Catherine how about you? So again um, I was always um, I, I was always attending CICM um, sort of the branch or um, uh, sort of events or um, going to sort of education conferences or some of the other um, 
credit conferences that are available. Um, and it was actually Debbie Tuckwood um, that sort of kept seeing my face. And then sort of, I, I think probably between, um, possibly between Debbie and, and Mary, um, would you like to teach? Um, and this is what you need to do. Um, you need to do this little teaching qualification. Um, and I was like, mm, not, not really sure, um, but why not give it a go? I don't mind talking I don't, in front of people. None of, none of that bothers me. Um, so as far as I was concerned, it's just, you know, I know the topic um, and it could be giving back to, to other people. Um, and now, actually, I find it absolutely fascinating with my students um, because my my 100 percent, my aim is to get those people to pass their exams. That's mm -hmm. all I want to do. I want to make sure everybody is passing um, get the best results that they can possibly imagine. Um, and therefore, I put the time in. Um, in order for the uh, for the students to to get to that point, and it's just it, it's giving back to them. Um, yeah. I've got the knowledge. I've gone through. I've got a career in credit of you know twenty five years plus. Um, I network through CICM. I do a lot for the CICM, but it's giving back that information um, to other people and helping them with their careers. I'm coming to the end of my career. Um, I mean, not for a while, but you know, I will be coming to the end of it at some point soon. I hope. Um, and, you know, if I can give that information to, to younger people or even other people that um, have maybe been in the industry a bit and they haven't managed to get to do their qualifications, um, then that's what I will do. Um, uh, and I, you know, I, it's just about giving back now. Um, yeah. The fact that actually I really enjoy teaching people and getting them to, to pass their exams. Oh, I love that answer. And how about you, Jules? Uh, well, I started um, teaching out of necessity <laughs> at the time I was um, running a, an international credit department of over 70 people. And uh, most of the people in that department were uh, young international graduates, very intelligent people, very few practical on the job skills um, and quite a, um, a, a high attrition rate. Uh, so what I needed to do, do was, well, we were doing training and training wasn't really cutting it. It was giving them the practical skills to do the job, but it wasn't making them engaged in the job, the career or the business. So we needed something bigger. So this is where external um, accredited qualifications was a real feather to their cap. And they, and they really enjoyed the idea of getting this external accredited qualification. So that's what we did to keep and it worked it kept the attrition down it gave us a lot of highly skilled people um, that stayed with the organization a lot longer so it was great for business um, and what it meant was someone had to coach them through these qualifications so I'd done the qualification I became the coach so that's kind of how it happened and uh, similar to Catherine um, Dr Debbie Tuckwood was here <laughs> on my shoulder noticing what's going on and saying, oh, you're quite a good teacher, aren't you? You should do this a bit more. Um, so she encouraged me um, alongside my management job and coaching all of my guys to also take on a teaching qualification, which I did, which seemed crazy at the time, um, as all of our students here who are doing CICM qualifications are thinking, this is mad. But honestly, when you come out the other side, it feels great. And it did for me, you know, I got this qualification and, and I've been um, working in teaching, not all full time, uh, like a lot of our guys here. I'm doing a bit of teaching alongside the day job, uh, but I love it. And um, I've similar to when I first started credit, you know, when Mary said I started it and went, oh, I really like this. Uh, <laughs> it was the same. I felt that about credit. I felt that about mm -hmm. teaching. So now I've got the perfect blend. So I can now talk about the credit industry, which is something I'm really passionate about. Um, and I get to, you know, stay um, on point with everything that's happening in the credit world, but also get to see those beautiful moments when the penny drops and a student understands what's happening. And then you see what that does to them and their yeah. career in the future. So, yeah, it's a really rewarding career. No, definitely. And I mean, all your answers, you all sound so passionate and you love what you do. And I suppose it, it's probably so much easier to teach the next generation of credit professionals when you love what you do so much. Um, and it sounds that any student that has you three will be so incredibly lucky and so supported in their pathway. Um, so, yeah, it, it's brilliant answers. Um, so we're going to come to um, Hiva now. 
Um, so Mary, Jules and Catherine have just spoke about how passionate they are for teaching. So what I'd like to know is how supportive were your teachers throughout your qualifications and have they made you think about potentially wanting to be a teacher too? Yeah, so fortunately for me, I, I found all my teachers to be just as supportive, actually. Um, I like the lesson structures. You've got the opportunity to ask questions as you go. You'd always give your class summaries for the readings and homework so you can really get a deep understanding of, of whatever is being taught. Um, you also always have a point of contact and you can reach out to your teacher at any time or arrange phone calls. Um, and especially with a level three, um, you, you have a, a talent coach or, or a tutor that's always there for you. Um, and they would actually reach out to you to check in on you every once in a couple of weeks as well. So you always have multiple points of contact and you're obviously always more than welcome to reach out to anyone in the wider organisation for help. So I feel there, there was quite a lot of support the entire time. I, there's never a moment where you didn't know where your point of contact was. Mm -hmm. um, as, as for teaching, I, I think I definitely do. Um, I think me and Mary are in the middle of uh, discussing how we're going about it. Really? Um, I think I'll really broaden my skill set. Um, and will allow me to bring that skill back to the to the office here and help me teach my team here as well. Um, uh, what else have I got here? I've got, um, yeah, and I think as I'm preparing my classes and, and teaching them, I think it'll make me more knowledgeable in the in the subjects I'm teaching. So it's, it's going to help me just in return. And I'm always looking for more opportunities to get involved with CRCM and this presented itself. So I thought, why not? Brilliant. And I also see that you're also um, an independent advisor for CICM. Could you just tell us a bit about how this came about? Uh, yes. Yeah. So after I finished my um, level five qualifications, um, I, I emailed CICM and said, how can I stay involved? Um, and they essentially gave me a, a few different roles I can get involved in. So sent my CV in um, and, and they had a role for me with the awarding side of the, um, the organisation. So that, that was me reaching out as well. So if, if you're interested, there's always ways to um, stay involved with CICM. Definitely. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's helped me a lot so far. Perfect. Love that. Uh, so now from kind of teachers to qualifications, if we start with yourself, Mary, um, what, have, what has been the benefits of being qualified and, and how have they helped you in your professional career? Massive, really. Um, so... You know, we've already talked about the fact that we might have fallen into this, but we mm -hmm. stayed because we love it. Um, and for me, I think studying, um, particularly some of the technical subjects, was an absolute game changer in terms of um, giving me that confidence and skill set to not only be really good at my job and then lead my teams. Because I think, you know, you lead by example, don't you? And I mm -hmm. took every opportunity to try to coach and, and steer them in the right way. But it also it's just empowering because your conversations with your um, all stakeholders, so not just your external customers, but, you, you know, your your commercial team, the directors that you're reporting into. It just changes the level of conversation because your understanding and skill set is so strong that you, you as I said before, you're, you're really able to hold your own in across all those um different sorts of relationships so I think you know I, I loved everything that I studied and when I did it Jules and Catherine were perhaps the same um we probably had about nine ten subjects to get through so you know the qualifications have changed over the years but we had about 10 10 different exams to do um yeah it took a while <laughs> um but some of the more technical ones like accounting law um legal proceedings there's such strong knowledge in that. It doesn't necessarily mean as a credit manager or a credit professional, you're going to end up doing all of that because, mm -hmm. of course, you know, you, you can't do it all. But it means that when you're having the conversations with the external stakeholders that you employ to do those jobs for you, you know exactly what the choices are, you know what can be done, you know the, the route that you want to go rather than kind of being told what will happen. You can control those scenarios far more. Um, so, you know, all of that just elevated you, my performance and made me in, enjoy my role um, even more. Perfect. And how about you, Jules? Uh, yeah, I mean, learning is, it's that J word, it's a journey, isn't it? So even yeah. though I've done my qualifications, I don't consider that I'll stop learning. We're all still learning. I think um, um, someone, I can't remember who was it, made a point of, oh, I think it was Hevar, that as you teach, you learn. So we're never, we're never not learning. And um, as one of the things that um, particularly apprenticeships talk about are three skill sets, this is more in Mary's area, and that is knowledge, skills and behaviours. And I think that's 
that I think that's ultimately what I got out of the qualification because sometimes you can have a lots of experience and skills to do the job but you haven't always got that kind of backup that knowledge of the wider understanding of why that is or what law is it that makes me have to do that or you know what is the the best practice standard and things like that so you, you, you're building knowledge and skills and then all the correct behaviors so I think it's the fact that um, when I took on this qualification course it gave me not just academic knowledge but also practical skills and how to put it into practice in the job role so the whole thing comes together usually and I say this from a tutor's point of view as well as a manager's you tend to see people have got a hole in one or in the other like they're really really smart academically but they haven't got the practical ability or the loads and loads of experience on the job but they perhaps just need that backup from an academic point of view so yeah. I think the qualifications did that for me and from a completely personal point of view well it just made me a better credit professional um but career wise well this is called skyrocket your career um <laughs> When I achieved my level three ACICM, um, that gave me my first pr promotion. So yeah. well, as soon as I got my level three, I became a credit supervisor. Um, once I secured my level five MCICM, got headhunted. So I, mean, I don't really need to say any more than that, I suppose. It's, you know, as soon as those letters popped onto my social media, please use your social media, everybody. Um, <laughs> then, yeah. It, it just yeah. opens so many doors. So not only do you have all that knowledge and wonderful practical ability that you use in your job, so you're confident and enjoy your job, you also get opportunities within your career as well. So it's a win-win. Definitely. And how about you, Catherine? Well, my job, um, as uh, my colleagues will tell you, is one of those that just covers um, everything. It's absolutely not pure credit control, credit risk, credit management in any shape or form. But everything that I do, I have gained information from the qualifications that I've done. Um, I cover insurance, legal, compliance, um, and I can just keep going on. Um, in companies, you'll find that there's sort of almost four different departments doing it. I do GDPR um, and it keeps going on. Mm -hmm. But all of this is touched within the qualifications that we do for the CICM. Um, and I went through right through to my degree. I'm a fellow of the Institute and I like to wear that badge very, very proudly because I really enjoy it. Um, Jules talking about skyrocketing your career and everything else. I like where I where I am. I'm, I'm at the top of the tree in where I am. So I'm at the stage in my career where I like to give back. So I work with Debbie doing the trailblazing for the apprenticeships. You know, I work with the CITM doing the teaching, doing the assessments for the new memberships, all of those kind of things. And then also, you know, with the branch committees um, doing our own webinars to give back to local um, local yeah. students, local members. So for me, it, it's kind of like you do your qualifications, you know what you're talking about, but being able to actually get that knowledge and apply it into your job when people say I'm not going to give you this information because of GDPR you can say well actually I just learned that last week and what you're telling me is not correct that's not the law this is the law um, you can sort of people will say um, why aren't you giving me credit um, you know and you can say well the sort of credit agency has got to give me zero risk but you'll do your qualification. You can understand why the credit ranking agency is giving zero risk. So you can actually talk to them and say, well, actually, it's because of X, Y and Z. So they will know that you've got that knowledge and then you can give it back. Doing credit policy, getting directors to sign off, um, being able to be at the board level um, and having the board coming to you and say, actually, we need this problem solved we're going to pick you because we know that you'll get the job done. It's brilliant. Um, and that's the knowledge that I've got from doing all of my qualifications, doing my teaching, giving back, constantly getting knowledge, constantly networking within the community that is absolutely massive. And then being able to give that back to everybody else that I'm either mentoring, tutoring, or just talking to in a conference. Yeah. Amazing. And what about you, um, Hifa? What about what what have what have been the benefits of being CICM qualified for yourself? 
Yeah. So I think, as I, I touched on earlier, it's especially if you're a little bit younger, it's a way to compete with people with a lot more experience than you, um, as opposed to having to wait the entire time, which can obviously take a long time to catch up to, to whatever that is. Um, I think it's also an alternative way to, to demonstrate your technical knowledge and experience mm -hmm. from the, the authority within the profession. So anyone that's dealing with you can have high confidence that you, you know everything you need to know to, to be competent in your job. Um, and I think the final point is um, just on a more personal level, it, it makes me, um, you can be more assertive and, and confident in general because you've got the knowledge um, and you can be a better decision maker, which, um, which I think is very important for the role. Brilliant. And I think kind of that that's what the great thing about studying our qualifications is about. So kind of from a marketing perspective, my top, myself and Tom, we see so many of our members tagging us um, on our LinkedIn page in posts about passing their modules and completing their level two and three and five journeys. Um, and we're also you can also see the benefits of, of studying, as Jewel said, you get your promotions and you get headhunted and um, kind of from my point of view that is kind of a, a great reason <laughs> to, to showcase your skills and your knowledge in your in your industry and your career to kind of get what you want um and as you say it, it opens doors as well um so we kind of have a, just a few more questions left um so professional development during and after completing your qualifications is, is obviously so important in keeping um, your skills updated and your knowledge. Um, so what, what are some of the ways that you yourself have continued your professional development, um, especially as kind of level five is essentially the last step of the qualification journey? Um, Jules, would you like to answer this one? I definitely want to answer this <laughs> one uh, because I've never seen level five as the last step. Um, I'm a member uh, by qualification up to MCICM, but I'm a fellow by membership mm -hmm. through experience um, because I've always seen that even beyond your qualifications, it's all about developing your knowledge and your skills and your behaviours yeah. as part of your continuing professional development. Uh, the difference is, I guess, once you've got your qualifications there, you take more charge really of how you're going to develop and what direction you want to take. Um, you've not got that structure, as Heval was talking about, that you get in your qualifications, which is really useful. It, you can tailor that to your career, but also it can be quite daunting and you haven't got, you feel like you haven't got the direction. So what I found really useful from a personal point of view are the professional standards. So CRCM's professional standards are the benchmark, like the gold standard of if you're doing this in your career, these are the sorts of things that you should be achieving. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really detailed. Um, and as a member, you can go on, which I've done, and take a skills audit. So you say, OK, I'm an FC ICM and this is my job role. Let me answer questions on what I what my strengths are, what my areas of development are. So I do that and then I develop my my CPD based on the output of that. So I found that really, really useful. Brilliant. And what about you, Mary? Yeah, really similar, actually. So the professional standards were officially launched last year, I believe. Um, was last year wasn't it maybe it was the back end of, of, of the year before uh and they're, they're they're great because they they were a result of a lot of time and effort with cicm engaging hundreds of of uh, members and organizations right across the gambit of of the credit profession to say what 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 are those skill sets what are those behaviors that people in our profession should have and be working towards improving mm -hmm. throughout their career so doing the professional standards audit as Jules said is a really good starting point and if anybody hasn't had a chance to do that we would absolutely encourage you to do so I should just say that that is a member only benefit and I am aware that if you're an apprentice learner with us then um, you're not always um, going to you, have, you might not have taken up that option of becoming a full student studying member your apprenticeship levy doesn't cover that so we always try to encourage you when you first join us to to think about doing that so that you can get the most out of networking um, and, and that's another point really so as Catherine's touched on networking is massive so being able to uh, link in with your community whether that's your local branch and going to face-to-face -face events 
Catherine's branch that uh, she, she does masses for has been particularly strong on virtual. And I think that's one of the things, we don't, there's not many things we thank COVID for, but we definitely moved towards a more virtual world, yeah. didn't we? Which means that these events that um, branches like East of England put on are actually open to all of our members. So it's not about, you know, you're not limited to, to where you live. So networking is, is huge as well. Um, and just making the most of all those opportunities we've said already teaching means you learn and I've never done a course yet where I haven't learned loads from from my groups it keeps us connected with what's actually going on there at the coal face if you like brilliant and then finally to kind of anyone on this call who is thinking about starting a CICM qualification what would be your parting gift to them so how would they go about starting and who would they talk to about what pathway to follow um Jules would you like to to answer um, well, Mary will have more of the technical answer to this, but <laughs> if I'm looking purely from a um, being there, done that point of view, I would say if you're thinking of starting your qualification journey, see it as a new chapter in your life, as Hevar said, be prepared for it mentally before you start, but don't get overwhelmed by the size of that chapter. So just take everything a page at a time. Um, so pick your first unit, or if you're halfway through, pick your next unit based on a subject that you like the sound of or something that you feel familiar with, and then focus on doing that one thing really, really well. And then you can worry about the rest of it after that. So really focus on one bit at a time. Don't get overwhelmed by the whole thing. And um, my other, if I can, squeeze another piece of advice in. <laughs> you can. Is use your credit community. I know Mary's just touched on it there. Basically, they have your back. Um, CICM is a huge family. It's there to care for all of its members. And this new Connect, uh, Student Connect, is going to be a really good um, a niche area where everyone that's in the same boat is coming together going, ah, how do I do this? Definitely. Um, so please get actively involved in it. For me, it's about connecting with others with the same learning journey as me. And that's what got me through. So I, I would strongly advise you do the same. Brilliant. And Catherine, what would be your parting gift to them? Jump in with both feet. Um, it's 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 really important. It doesn't matter what level you're at, whether you're just starting out or whether you're in a, um, you know, speak to the CICM about the levels that you you want to join. But you you really need to just um, you know embrace the community. Um, as Jill said, um, there are so many sort of conferences. Um, branches that are available that you can get involved with where people have got loads of knowledge um, Mary was saying about the branch that I'm I'm in um, which is the East of England branch um, and I've been a member there now for, for probably um, 10 years or so um, you know we would do face-to-face -face events we would do um, we went on and did the webinars we still do a lot of webinars but you know the committee we meet every month we discuss what needs to be done. We discuss about what things are going to be needed for the members, because there's no put it point putting a, an event on if nobody wants to join, yeah. um, if, if they all find it's boring. So we want to do whatever the members want. Um, and, and yes, we, we've got our LinkedIn page. You know, we make, make sure that we post things as much as possible. I communicate a lot about the CICM because I'm sort of learning development and that's my part on the committee. Um, but, you know, we want to listen to what people want um, yeah. and then using Knowledge Hub, um, all the other uh, conferences that are available online, offline, face to face, um, however it is that's there using the magazine. There are so many fields that you can sort of touch into um, and gain that knowledge um, use your CCT um, and just be constantly learning. And it's just I, I find that if you click into all of those bits then you know your career will just keep going brilliant and what about you mary yeah i mean i could echo all of those thoughts really <laughs> I, I would say do it it's it, you won't regret it you know we talked about how um much of a game changer it's been for all of our careers so I 100% advocate it, but I do, I, I am always really honest with people as well. Um, and I think Hevar said, you know, you've, you've got to, you've got to have the, the right time and the mindset. Um, it's always tough juggling study, home life, work. 
Um, but when you're passionate enough about something, it, it's like anything, isn't it? We, we find a way to make it work, but yeah. don't, don't go into it lightly. You know, it does require quite a bit of commitment. Um, but as Jules said, just just make a start with it you know focus on that one unit don't think about the fact that you know you could be studying for two years or more because actually although we talked about two three four years I think every one of us would probably say when you look back it went really quickly it's incredible how that time does at the same time as feeling you know you're talking about two three four years but it does go quickly and that's one of the beauties about our qualifications as well actually if we put the apprenticeships aside because clearly you're on a tight timeline if you're doing an apprenticeship but if you're not we're really flexible so we're not saying to people you've got to complete it in this amount of time um you have to do x amount of units you know we've got some people that do more than one unit at a time most focus on one um so we 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 are really flexible about that so we can make it work around what's going on with your life but you do need to go into it knowing that it is a big commitment and it's going to require you know time and effort but it will be so so worth it Brilliant. And last but not least, Heather, what about you? What's your parting gift? I think I'm on the same page as everyone, to be honest. It can <laughs> be a bit daunting at the start, thinking you have to commit yourself to the entire qualification. But once you start, as has been said, you're essentially only doing one unit at a time. So as soon as you get that process in motion, um, you're doing one thing at a time and supported throughout the whole process. And at the end, it opens up a lot of doors. So you're not just doing it for the sake of doing it. It speeds up your progress. Um, it makes you more confident, assertive, knowledgeable. Um, so it really does help you overall. Brilliant. Well, that's it from me with all the questions. Um, this has been a great chat and, and hopefully everyone on the call has, it's kind of made you think about maybe starting a CSM qualification and kind of skyrocketing your own career. Um, I've seen the chat is buzzing. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Tom. Tom, what have we got in the chat box? Yeah, so the first question I think uh, that, that comes up, and it comes up quite commonly, I don't think Mary will be too surprised to hear this one. Um, it's, I have many years in experience in credit control, uh, and I would like to get my qualification. However, I have no idea where to start or how to start going about this. Uh, what level should I come in? Uh, and what is the general structure, study commitment, hours uh, that will be needed to, to do that? Okay, so yes, it's not it's not an unusual um, situation with people saying, "Where do I start?" And as as you perhaps know, we have level two, level three, level five qualifications, and we call them um, entry, uh, intermediate, and advanced. And just to put that into context. You do not have to start with level two. It's a reasonable assumption. Lots of people assume you've got to do level two before you can move on to level three. And that, that's not the case. We would say that level two tends to be pitched towards people with little or no experience in credit or particularly nervous maybe about getting back into study. Um, anybody with experience, we would be normally saying look at least at level three. Um, and level three gives a really strong foundation for people if they do go on to do level five. So level three is geared towards people with some experience. They might already be team leaders. They might be looking to build up those technical skills that their experience hasn't necessarily given them. So the experience is fabulous because you're gonna be able to contextualize all this learning and really get to grips with it. And sometimes it is with certain subjects about consolidating your knowledge and just giving you that sort of green light about the confidence. I do know what I'm doing and it reinvigorates things. But the technical stuff, generally we find, you know, there will be gaps in people's technical knowledge regardless of how much um, experience they've had. And we do still strongly advise that if you're thinking about going on to level five and level five is the advanced, it's to put it into context. But I often find when I'm talking to people, if you give that some other level with qualifications, people then start to get it. So level two is roughly equivalent to GCSE. Level three is roughly equivalent to A level and level five is second year degree. So there's quite a jump from level three to level five. At level five, we, we say to people, there's an assumption that you will have robust understanding and knowledge in areas such as law, um, accounts and finance, good credit management practices, and also the business environment sort of module. So understanding how, how you know, the links between supply and demand, that sort of thing. And that's where you might not have that understanding. So that's why we'll often say to people, even if you've got quite a lot of experience, don't discount level three, because that's going to give you the absolute rock solid foundation to do very well at level five. Um, 
there are occasions when people will say, I really feel I should go straight in at level five. And if you've got lots and lots of experience, you're already a, a manager and a leader of people. That's one tick. But we will have a conversation about what's your academic background like if you haven't maybe done a first degree already. You're jumping in at what is a second year degree course. So what we're trying to do is make sure that nobody gets overwhelmed too quickly. So I would say the vast majority of people joining us are joining us at level three. And then there was a couple of other questions in there, wasn't there, in terms of times and so on. Yeah, so, sort of study time, how long that takes. Yeah, so we normally recommend with level three uh, to be looking at sort of 18 months to two years to complete that. The structure now on our new diplomas in credit and collections is that you need to pass four units at level three to achieve that diploma. And one strict rule is that one of those units must be a mandatory credit management unit. So actually, we often advise that that's the one you start with. The credit management, trade, consumer and export unit, for example, which covers the whole range of um, environments, sits both on our level two and our level three framework. So actually people study the same material, but it's when they take the exam that it will be determined if they come out with a level two pass, in which case you can maybe continue down a level two pathway should you wish, or you can retake that exam um, to, to hopefully get a level three on your next uh, submission. And um, because that sits on both, that, that sometimes is the way to get started because that will help people that are not quite sure the level that they're at, do that one first and, and then see where you go from that. And the rest of the qualification, it, there's no other mandatory units. It's, there's a mixture of examined units and assignments. So it might be that you do a mix and match, some yeah. assignments, some exams. We can talk to you about what's the most appropriate fit. Moving on to level five, there's six subjects, but you only need to achieve four. Uh, no mandatory units. You pick the four that are right for your role or the skill set that you want to improve on. And once you've successfully passed those, you will have achieved your level five. And we recommend about two years for that as well. I mean, these are recommendations. Sometimes people will take longer. Some people that want to fast track might do that in less time, but that's generally um, what we advise. And study time, we will be saying to people, you need to be allowing a good five to six hours a week whilst you're studying one unit. Just to give you a, an idea of time, we, we suggest that the total qualification time on all of our level three units is around 100 hours and a similar sort of time for level five, hence why we suggest five to six hours a week. Does that answer all the questions? I think I think you've done a good job to do that. Yes. <laughs> um, there's uh, just to sort of solidify what you just said. There's a few people in here that have said, you know, I've had 10 plus years of experiences and I'm quite glad to have started at level three. Oh, um, so, you know, that, that being a common starting point, I suppose. Um, I had a question earlier as well in regards to is there a mentoring or tutoring program, which I think kind of ties into what I was going to ask from a private question that I've been asked uh, about what's the difference between learning support and virtual classes? Okay, do you want me to take that one? Yeah. Yeah. So um, our virtual classes are, I suppose, our gold standard in terms of support because it's live teaching. And depending on the subject, you're going to get anything from sort of six times two hour lessons up to 12 uh, two hour lessons. We spread them out generally over a sort of four month period and we'll build in weeks in between those live lessons where you're doing private directed study. So you're on study the whole time. So four months of study, but you're not necessarily attending a class every week. So that is actually taught components. Um, so we're bringing to life in the classroom what you will have already pre read and what you'll go away and post read afterwards and do some um, specific homework activity that we can give you uh, feedback on. So that's the classes. So it's very much a taught, very planned program of getting you through that unit. With the learning support service, it's actually a home study coaching package. And there's lots of reasons uh, why people might go for LSS, as we call it. They might not be able to make the virtual classrooms because that does require an ongoing commitment. They're live classes, so you need to attend. Um, it might be that we've not got a virtual class for that particular unit because we tend to do them on a demand basis. So if we've not got loads of demand for perhaps one of the level two assignment units, for example, we would always offer you learning support as a, a, an alternative to that. And some people 
prefer to study more independently. They don't want to be in a classroom. So we're trying to make sure that there's something there for everybody. With LSS, it tends to work on a contract that for that unit is six months in duration, which covers at least two sort of assessment periods if you're doing an assignment, because we offer four opportunities a year to submit assignments with the exam subjects there on demand mostly. So you book that exam when you're ready for it. And it's two hours of contracted support, which doesn't sound like very much, but actually it does work quite well because the tutor or coach, we try and distinguish. So a tutor is in a classroom, a coach is, is LSS, but often our tutors and coaches are the same people. They're doing both roles, um, but they will, have a call with you they'll go through the uh the unit that you're doing make sure that you understand its requirements and then they'll agree check-in points with the learner if you're doing an assignment for example they'll agree dates when you need to submit your draft um, feed of your draft responses to that assignment so that they can put a critical eye on it give you some feedback tell you where in their opinion and it is their opinion because they won't be marking it at the end um, what they think you might need to do to improve on that and you can check in with them uh, at, at different times so it works really well as an alternative if for any of those reasons you, you can't do a virtual classroom awesome i've also got another one sort of just off the back of that those virtual classes and um, when do they generally run is it day or evening um can i decide to do self-learning which i suppose is the self-study package that she's uh, referring to here is that the home study support um, and how do i know where the nearest exam venue would be okay so firstly on the classes we tend to try to offer our classes on at least three starts a year so typically they run uh, late january early february we then do another intake around june july and september october now that's the sort of core times when we're going to be looking at, at starting classes and you're either working towards an exam at the end of that or a particular period when you would submit an assignment so we gear it around that with regards to day and evening, our open classes, and we distinguish open meaning not for apprentices. So let me just clarify that. Apprentices have to be allowed to study in the day because part of the apprenticeship programme says it's got to be off the job training. So we put the daytime classes on predominantly for our apprentice learners who, by the way, are studying exactly the same content as non-apprentice learners from a CICM perspective, because what we do is just that technical delivery. There is other work you have to do as an apprentice that your training provider works with you on. But from a CICM perspective, we're taking you through our technical qualification. Where we have space on our daytime classes, because sometimes they're not full with all of our apprentices, we'll always advertise them. And so we generally find these days it is a mixture of apprentices and non-apprentices in the daytime classes, which is great because the more people we have in a class, the more experience and variety and anecdotal sort of sharing of knowledge and understanding you're getting. So we, we try very hard to make sure that it's a really good mix. The evening classes tend to be more for what we call open, meaning we're not going to see apprentices on them because they're not studying at night. Uh, again, it's a mixture of people from all different industries and different levels of experience. We offer the daytime and the evening classes on that same kind of schedule of Jan, uh, summer and then um, autumn term. LSS is really flexible because you literally start it when you want to start it. So you get your six months contract from the point you begin and to when you end. So that's very, very flexible. In terms of exam centres, if you are taking an, a unit which is assessed by multiple choice exam, we partner with Pearson View, who are all over the country. In fact, they're international, um, but it, you shouldn't have to go too far to find a local Pearson View centre to book your multiple choice exam. And they're actually on demand, meaning that you can book it when you're ready to take it. But if you're on a virtual classroom programme with us, we have planned your course so that you should know when you should be booking and taking your exam, which is quite important because we don't want you to miss the start of the next courses. And often people don't like to start another course unless they've already taken that exam. So we will tell you when you should be booking and taking your exam, but in, in, in principle, they are on demand. The exception to exams is our accounting principles unit. That is an exam, but it's only offered four times a year, similarly to our assignments. And it's not run by Pearson View. It's actually an American company, which is why it's online only. Um, so with Pearson View, you can go into a centre with uh, your accounting exam. You do have to take that in an online environment. And we offer that four times a year. Assignments are four times a year, January, March, June and October submission.
Awesome. I think we've only got time for one more question. Um, so anyone that has put a question that hasn't been answered, uh, we've got the chat, so we'll be able to designate your question to the right person in the right department who can get back to you pretty quickly. Um, so don't worry if you've not been answered on here, we will sort all that after the call. Um, so last question then is, are all units multiple choice or is there essay style units on level three? Are all units multiple choice exam or is there essay style units on level three? So it is a mix. Um, so uh, we have a range of exams on level three and we have uh, assignments as well. The only rule about level three is you have to take at least one credit management principal unit and that is a multiple choice exam. The other three units that you pick can depend on your subject specialisms that you want to take and or if you're going on to level five in which case we still strongly recommend that you make up that level three qualification with business environment business law and accounting principles that's our advice but it's not set in stone if somebody really wants to swap one of them out and has a particular um, sort of passion or, or feel for credit risk then you could swap one of them out and do credit risk instead and that's an assignment Awesome. Perfect. And um, I'll just throw in on the end here that if there are any other questions that arise out of the back of this, we've sp sort of spoken about it throughout the whole call. Um, but I'm just going to put the link in again so that you can all receive it. That goes to CISM Student Connect. Uh, that is basically your guys' group so that you can go in, ask the questions. It can be picked up really easily by a member of our team at CICM or by one of your community colleagues. So, you know, that's something that, that is there for you if you have a question. And we'll get back to you on all the questions that went unanswered. Um, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so thank you, as Tom said, to everyone taking the time out this afternoon to join us. Um, just to reiterate, we will be circling uh, this webinar shortly. So look out for an email and obviously it will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, a final thank you to our guests, uh, Jules, Catherine, Mary and Hiva for taking the time out of their busy schedules to take part in this webinar. It has been greatly appreciated and you've all been great. Um, do keep a lookout for the next CICM webinar and we hope to see you all soon. Um, hope you have a great uh, afternoon. Bye. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.